We will be talking about plagiarism, what it is, the problems that are attached to it and what we can do as university teachers to prevent students from plagiarizing. I have with me Diane Pecorari from City University in Hong Kong. Very much welcome. Hi Clara. Um, we have read your uh, article that you wrote together with Philip Shaw called Types of Student Intertextuality and Faculty Attitudes. What is this article about, Diane? Right, well it's about university teachers' perceptions of plagiarism, student plagiarism in particular. And what we did was we took some examples of how students write and also the sources that students had used. And we took those around to experienced university teachers and said, what do you think? Is this okay? And if the answer was no, it's not okay, then we followed up and asked, so is this plagiarism? Yeah, so, so how could you then understand what, what plagiarism is? Right, so plagiarism is an intertextual relationship, that is, it's a relationship among or between different texts, and it's the relationship that arises when somebody, when a writer uses words or ideas from another text, but does not adequately or appropriately signal that relationship. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hear a lot of university teachers being worried uh, about uh, students' tendency to plagiarizing. And it's, it seems that this is actually an increasing problem uh, at university level. So um, what, what, if, if we think about the different uh, problems from the student perspective, we have interviewed some of your students from City University in Hong Kong about uh, how they view the problems uh, involved regarding plagiarism. When I was a freshman, I, I really hard to avoid. I mean, I really do not know how to know, how to develop my essay within academic honesty. It's always need to use other people's thoughts and do not know how to uh, make those reference fit for my essay, but as I write more essays, I find I know how to better use of other people's other people's article and how to pick up some words or pick up some paragraph that I do need into my essay to serve for my paper rather than rather than just copy it or just paraphrase other people's article. Make sure that you don't use, um, take their ideas as your own. Um, it's a simple concept at first, but it kind of got complicated in high school, personally for me, with the introduction of APA and, all, and just referencing formats, really. Um, but uh, in hindsight, it was a good process that I went through. Well, Diane, uh, now if we uh, first consider what the first student, Diane also, yes. uh, what she is saying, well, what are your comments to, uh, to her concerns about plagiarism? Well, she is really describing what I'd like to hear every student say. So she says that at the beginning of her university studies, she was quite unsure, but she thought about it and she paid attention to what she was doing and she learned. and. That's the natural course of things. Bourdieu famously said that academic discourse is nobody's mother tongue. So everybody comes to university needing to learn how to do academic writing. And what she said she has learned eventually is absolutely spot on. So she says now when she uses sources, she makes them serve her purpose. And that of course is what every academic writer should aspire to do. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I have understood there is quite a lot of, of uh, research on, on this topic uh, yes. nowadays and uh, how uh, also the, the difficulty with the uh, different uh, terms and, and the, uh, the challenges in finding the way of paraphrasing seems to be something that uh, it's not easily detectable for, for students. If, if we then go to Leonardo, what, what is your comment about his statement? So, he too describes a learning process. 
and he describes something that I've heard from other students that he's he's had an uncomfortable time, um, particularly at the beginning, understanding what he's supposed to be doing. Um, but he is working actively with with the concept. I have a little concern when he talks about APA referencing style. I have a little concern that maybe in his mind he has confused the mechanics of how you format a reference with the much more important principled matter of signaling to your reader how you view sources, how other sources have influenced the text that you're writing. Nobody was ever accused of plagiarism because their reference list wasn't perfectly formatted according to APA style. So those are two kind of different things and possibly he's conflating them. So you think that there might be, uh, is it, can be a, this can be a common problem uh, that students misunderstand what plagiarism actually has to do with? Well, yes, they, they misunderstand plagiarism frequently. They also misunderstand what they're meant to be doing when they're writing academic texts, because if writers are working with their sources in an appropriate way, they won't plagiarize by definition. I think actually Diane's um, insight about making her sources serve her text's purpose, that's quite a mature understanding. I think misunderstandings are, are the rule rather than the, the, rather than the exception. And that it seems also that she's commenting on that the, the fact that she has written a lot has helped her. Yes. I think so, because after all, um, you know, again, if we, if we think less about blocking plagiarism and enabling students to write well, including writing from sources, then that's a skill. And the only way you learn any skill, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's playing tennis or riding a horse or writing good academic texts, practice is the key. Mm. I think we will listen to, from the teacher's perspective here, uh, yeah. Matthias, who is from Stockholm University yes. and uh, a teacher in uh, biology or biosciences. Uh, he will tell us about his perspective. Yes, I would say we have a course uh, where the students do some scientific writing and they are not, have very little experience with that when they come to this course. And uh, we have experienced that uh, these students have difficulties in actually understanding uh, how to do this properly. And uh, so for that reason, what we do is we try to teach them a little bit about, you know, how, what is the difference between plagiarism and paraphrasing, for example and uh, how to do it properly and that can be quite difficult because um, some a lot of the text uh, that the people come in contact with is very technical meaning that it's difficult then to paraphrase it in your own words because you need to use these technical terms yeah, so so he has somewhat a different perspective. Well, what are your comments to his concerns? Well, I'm really pleased, first of all, when he talks about a course that teaches some of these skills to students, because most of the university teachers I know are concerned at some level that their students may not have the skills they need to, to do the writing they need to. But not every department, not every course actually offers training in those skills. So so that's very important. Um, he comes on to the idea, I, I, I think if I'm paraphrasing him fairly, I, I think when he talks about terminology, what he means is this idea that there are only so many ways to say the same thing. Um, so if you're dealing with a, a fairly complex and technical topic, um, one person's rendering of it might closely resemble another person's. And there I think it's important to keep in mind that plagiarism is about more than similarity. It's about similarity because somebody has copied something from somebody else. Um, so, you know, the fact that there can be similarities al alone is not necessarily problematic. Yeah, and, and I think this, this uh, links also to the, the findings of your, of your paper where you identify four different kind of types of ways that teachers talk about plagiarism or the, the way they assess the student work. 
um, where and and I was wondering how uh, Matthias' uh, understanding here of of uh, how plagiarism is about the difficulty of expressing yourself when when there are new perhaps difficult technical concepts that you're going to use where where is the limit for when a student is actually plagiarizing and when it's about using and and making use of the new terms yes so yes you you're right when when we asked these university teachers to talk to us about how they saw students using sources, um, they would, they really struggled actually to, to understand whether what they were looking at was plagiarism. And one of the things they made reference to was this idea that Matthias brings up of, well, yes, I see similarities here, but actually there's a lot of technical terminology here. So, probably this isn't copied, probably this isn't plagiarism, because you couldn't really say it very much differently from this. So that was very much one of the, the things that teachers used um, as a help to understand whether something was plagiarism or not. So were, were there also examples of, of kind of clear plagiarism in your material? or We um, showed examples to the teachers that varied in, in, in lots of different features. Most teachers found one example to be very problematic. Not all of them wanted to label it as plagiarism, um, but there was a great deal of individual variation. And by that I don't mean that some teachers were stricter than others. I mean that they seemed to be paying attention to different features. So the first teacher would say example A is plagiarism and example B is not, and the next teacher would say precisely the opposite. So that means that uh... It should be really important for us as teachers to to discuss uh, where we understand the the limit is, uh, or where, how we understand plagiarism. I guess. Yes, precisely. How we understand plagiarism in relationship to what we expect that students will do, because it's a very problematic situation for a student if. We have a student who's in, in your class and of course Clara is very nice and, and looks at the student work and says this isn't a problem and then she comes to my class and I look at it and say this is plagiarism. Well that puts students in an extremely uncomfortable position. They don't know what's expected of them. But I think this might be even a, an inherent problem then, at, at least in Swedish universities where students take a lot of courses within one department yes. and then they go to a different department. So this must also be framed by the, the disciplinary discourse, if you would say so, the, the way that things are uh, attended to and, and how things are viewed in a certain discipline compared to others. Absolutely, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect is that when students are moving from department to department over the course of their university studies, it's very difficult for any given teacher to know what sort of instruction, training, opportunities for practice that student has had before. And therefore it's very difficult for the teacher to have good expectations of what the student can do and whether the student knows how to use sources appropriately. Yeah, so I thought we will end uh, uh, this part by looking into the strategies that we can use. And we can start by uh, listening again to the students and their views of of uh, strategies uh, against plagiarism. Okay. I think my strategy is to get a main idea for my essay. So the main idea is is a kind of logical for my essay. So if I have my own logical to write my essay, to organize my essay, then it is much more easier for me to to know how to better use the reference from others instead of just copying or or paraphrase from others' reference. Yeah. Oh yeah, and Turnitin, I guess, really helps out. Um, is really helpful. Um, although it doesn't uh, show the passages that I may be um, uh, plagiarizing well, um, after I submit it, before the deadline, um, it does help after each... Uh, it helps after the assignment is graded. And I get to see uh, which parts are highlighted um, 
and what I could do better next time. Uh, yeah, the fact that it's not continuous, um, really make sure that you are careful and thoughtful. Yeah, so, so uh, Diane here brings up uh, this uh, approach where she uh, tried to find the main idea of her essay. I think it's a quite a nice uh, yes. way of, of uh, uh, seeing, uh, of uh, looking for a strategy, trying to organize. She puts an emphasis on organizing her essay. Yes. So, once again, she's taking a very mature approach to this whole question. Um, novice writers, young, inexperienced university students, often find it very difficult to know what they want to say when they sit down to write. If you don't know what you want to say, it's very easy to substitute other people's words for your own ideas, and that leads very naturally into plagiarism. When you know what you want to say, then it becomes very easy to draw on your sources selectively and use the bits that actually support your argument, but not let their voices drown yours out. So, so what do you think then of, of Leonardo's suggestion here to use Turnitin as a student, which is a, a text matching software? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased at one level that he is engaging with this question and trying to learn about it. Um, I have some concerns about using text matching software in general, and one of them is that he, it does give a lot of false negatives. It gives false negatives and false positives, and it has other problems. But what he's saying basically is he looks at the Turnitin report, and it signals problems. And when it signals problems, he says, right, I need to look at this. Now, the difficulty is, of course, that text matching software usually doesn't find everything. Now, an experienced user says, I know that this report isn't showing me everything, but I'm afraid that somebody with less experience might look at that and say, my writing strategy here was fine. The proof that it's fine is that I didn't get nasty red flashing lights when my paper went through the, the text matching software. So that's kind of a, a, a dangerous lesson. Lots of teachers and students like to use text matching software formatively. Um, it can be useful, but it has to be used with caution and with a lot of knowledge about what it can and can't be trusted to do. Yeah, and I, I guess this is what I have heard as a teacher, at least, that uh, I mean, even if you, if you see a lot of red lights, you really need to check the text uh, for, I mean, there are uh, quotations and uh, paraphrasing and to to what limit because that's something that you bring up in your article as well yes. i mean where the, where is the limit is it when you paraphrase or when you kind of use uh, a line of 15 words or eight words or 30 words or where where does it turn into plagiarism right. and this is the thing you need and to discuss ab absolutely and the answer to that of course is that it doesn't turn into plagiarism at any particular number of words because plagiarism is about more than just just similarities between texts, but that's the only feature that text matching software can tap into. Well, thank you very much, uh, Diane, um, for coming. We have discussed how important or how difficult it is to, to work with plagiarism problems. But what we can do as university teachers is that we can discuss it together so that we find shared views on, on what, where we draw the line or how we understand it, but also to provide opportunities for our students to practice and to realize what their skills are in relation to writing and paraphrasing and quoting academic texts.